Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. And guess what? Today is the day of the great dreaded unpardonable sin. You know, now you've heard many stories. We're going to document exactly what it is today whereby you'll never, never have to guess again or wonder. And regardless of what some revolving rev might tell you it is, you're going to know for yourself from Christ's own mouth, okay? So with that uh, having been said, we start a new chapter today, chapter 12, a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name. Luke chapter 12, verse 1, and it reads, In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, thousands of them, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, he started, first of all, this is what he said, Beware ye the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, he had just come down on them pretty hard, and you remember what that word means. It means play actors. But he says this a little better over in the uh, 16th chapter of Matthew. I want to turn there, and I want to pick it up in this Matthew 16, 11, same report, so that you know what he's, that he's not talking about bread, that is to say, leavened bread, but... This is what he's talking about, Matthew 16, verse 11. How is it that you do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that um, you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, 12? Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of the bread, but of the doctrine, I repeat, doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, anytime you have a multitude together, you're going to have many doctrines in that group. And there's one thing about a person that is bestowed, uh, with, that has a doctrine bestowed upon him, good, bad, ugly, in between, doesn't matter. They want to get that doctrine out. So what Christ is saying, you be careful of it. Be very careful. And many times in the name of Christ himself, people will put out doctrines of men. And they, they make void the real truth. So understand that as, as he begins. First of all, he said that to the 12 that had to maintain the stability that a man, woman, or woman, or child of God should. That you don't sway around with doctrines. That you stick with what is written. For that's from your father, your nearest relative, and that's exactly how it'll come to pass, not what some man might say, okay? Returning to Luke chapter 12, verse 2. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be made known. Um, everything's going to be found out. In other words... Many times it's very difficult to get the real truth out, but it's going to come out and it will uncover those that teach falsely. It's going to un uncover false teachings for the simple fact that there's only one cr true Christ. And what this is leading up to is, quite frankly, that you have two. And you could be deceived by the false one thinking he was the true Christ. I don't know. Did you know there is a difference? And did you know that the false comes first before anyone gathers back to the true Christ via uh, uh, flight pattern or no flight plan or whatever, okay? The false one's coming first. Verse 3, Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. By who? Well, who's on the housetops? Well, naturally, before air condition, this is where people sat in the evening, but also that's where the watchmen stood. And those that were watching would hear the truth, and by who? God's elect. God knew that he would give platforms that people could reach out with the truth 
and that it would be cried even to the watchmen that had eyes to see and ears to hear. Verse 4, And I say unto you, my friends, and here tenderly he calls them friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, have no more that, uh, that they can do. In other words, they can't affect your soul. Satan might even uh, twist your soul a little bit, but man can murder someone. He can kill a body, but he can't kill your soul. Your soul goes instantly to the Father, and it's waiting there for that dude when he gets there. Maybe to send him straight to hell. People think there are no unsolved mysteries in heaven. And God is the judge, the judge, okay? Now, uh, I want to make a note in passing for, uh, probably you should make a note of Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. I think it, uh, well, let's, let's, uh, let's quote five here and then we'll get back to that. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed, that's to say the flesh, hath power to cast into hell into the abyss. That's the blotting out. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. In other words, this was Almighty God who can also, as it would read in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, uh, and that's, that's a, a, a verse that is worthy of, um, of remembering because it stipulates there this same thing that um, certainly uh, fear not those that can harm your flesh body, but he that can blot your name out of the book of life and sentence you to death, period. So um, there you have it. In other words, obey God and hope it pleases men. If it doesn't, tough. All right? Just real tough. Because pleasing your Father gives you eternal life, and it should be pleasing to all men. Now, um, we continue on then. Verse 6, let's go with it in chapter 12. Are not five sparrows sold for two flocklands? This is, this wouldn't even be about, uh, let's see, one sixteenth, um, uh, two sixteenths, about one eighth of a penny, all right? And not one of them is forgotten before God. I mean, about one of the worthless, as far as selling is concerned, there is, lowest price, about, about an eighth of a penny. That's all that a, that a sparrow would be worth, and yet God knows every one of them. Why? He's the creator. He is the creator of life, the life giver. And, um, and so, um, verse 7, continuing, and then we'll make further comment. But even the very hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Now, or a whole flock of them. You're more valuable. Now, what, what God is saying here, Christ is teaching God's, the Father's word, don't worry. What are you worried about? If God numbers every sparrow and every hair on your head is numbered, what are you worried about? It is he that will let, allow your soul to live eternally or sentence, sentence it to death. And he loves you. And what this is going to add up to before all is said and done on worry, uh, that, that um, worry can add one little ounce to your life. All it can do is hurt. So that's where faith and trust in God is paramount because from that comes peace of mind and all the attributes that go with it. That is to say, happiness, success, and so forth. Verse 8. Also I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. Now, this word um, confess, or as it implies, is more, it, it is even stronger. It means covenant, a very close relationship. When you testify of him, of his, uh, in truth, of course, you cannot tell about Christ without the crucifixion, but what is more important, where most people fall short, they don't talk about Christ crucified. Because when you talk about Christ crucified, you've got to say, 
why he was crucified, where he was crucified, and who crucified him. The four W's. And uh, so giving the full truth, therefore identifying, giving you in hand the key of David and so forth. He said, hey, you confess me and I'll confess you, meaning you're going to be all right in that book. Verse 9. Now we're coming up on the unpardonable sin. The only one. It is written and it is mentioned in more places than one in God's Word, but this is the more complete um, teaching concerning the unpardonable sin. Verse 9. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. In other words, you de deny me even in the flesh, and you're going to be denied. 10. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But, this is the other side of the coin, this is the unforgivable. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven. Now, I want to be very clear and concise, as Luke only can do here. Who is the Son of Man? Natural, well, that's Jesus. Yeah. That's when the man is anthropos, all right? That's God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. While he was in the flesh, you could talk against him, and that would be forgiven. But when the Comforter was sent for a special reason, if you refuse that Comforter, it, when having eyes to see and ears to hear, then that is unforgivable. What am I saying? Not everyone can commit the unpardonable sin or unforgivable sin. Only God's elect that know better. All right? And we'll document this to the letter. Verse 11. And when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto magistrates and powers, Take ye no thought how or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say. But what is he saying here? Well, verse 12. For the Holy Spirit shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. Now, I want you to underline the word hour there in your mind. For it's speaking about a specific time when all this occurs, when it takes place, when the Holy Spirit will speak through those without they premeditating what they will say. Many of you have heard this. It's good. There are new people that need to know concerning the unpardonable sin. So let's, let's catch everyone up to speed to this point. Son of Man, that title for Messiah, Yeshua, is to say, well, Psalms 8, if you have trouble understanding it, make a note of Psalms 8 and cover the entire just psalm, and you will see that Christ being made a little lower than the angels in the flesh, anthropos, it speaks of him as he walked in the flesh upon the earth as man, anthropos in the Greek then any denying him then could be forgiven. He may not confess you before the angels, but that could be forgiven. But for when you were delivered up, this takes a specific trail before the synagogue of who? Satan, of course. If you denied the Holy Spirit the privilege of speaking through you in that hour, that would not be forgiven. Now, uh, let's identify, if we may, that hour beyond any doubt so that you know what the unforgivable sin is because many shall ask you. You've all heard me mention Mark 13 many times. We're going to go there. Mark chapter 13. And I want you to make special note of it. And this is in the simplicity in which Christ teaches. Don't try to read something into it. The, the subject at this time, the unpardonable sin. Mark 13, verse, uh, let's pick it up with verse 9. And it reads, same place, same subject, same hour, which I will document. Christ still teaching. 
but take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, that's Sanhedrians in the Greek, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, that's the synagogue of Satan, and you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake. Now don't overlook that. For your sake, dear one, no, for Christ's sake you will, you will be delivered there for a testimony against them, meaning that God intends to use your mouth to mouth the truth, whereby the truth will be heard to the entire world, quite frankly, as I have no doubt in my mind, after the spurious Messiah appears, when this particular hour takes place, that, uh, that uh, this is why it can't be hidden under a box or a basket. It's going around the world. Verse 10, and the gospel must first be published among all nations. That's the purpose, the real truth just before that great advent. You see, Mark 13, the disciples ask him, what's it gonna be like when you return? And he gives seven things. And this happens to be one of them that will transpire. They're the exact as the seven trumpets, the seven seals, or the seven vials. Only given in detail in the simplicity in which Christ teaches that anyone could understand. Verse 11. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand. There it goes again. Take no thought beforehand what you shall speak. Neither do ye premeditate, don't even think about it. But whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, underline that in your mind, there's that hour again. In that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost if you prefer. Um, I prefer spirit because that's what the manuscripts say. Now, we have one specific hour that this takes place in, and there's only one. And of course, that hour is the hour that we're delivered up before the synagogues of Satan when the spurious Messiah appears, as it's written in Matthew 24, Luke 21. We'll be covering this same subject again. You'll read of it in the book of Revelation, whereas the, the, um, the hour is mentioned more than one time and many other times in the Word of God, the, that hour of the advent, the second advent, the return of Christ as he does return. Also, it is written concerning um, the um, uh, return, if you would, of the spurious Messiah. You'll read of it and know what brings that hour into existence in Revelation chapter 17, and I think we should turn there. I think we should turn to Revelation 17 and nail down what is taking place. You've heard of how that the ten rulers will take uh, charge from around the seven areas, uh, continents I'll call them, and be in control. But it doesn't happen until a certain thing transpires, and that's that the son of perdition appears. And uh, as you're turning to the 12th verse, I'm going to read the 11th of chapter 17. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and of the seven and goeth into perdition. That can only be one because there's only one son of perdition. Perdition means to perish, sentenced to death, and that's Satan. Everyone else will be judged on Judgment Day, but this is Satan. Now, verse 12 of Revelation 17 to pick up what hour we're talking about. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. They're ten men right here on earth that are going to be governors for the period of time that he's here, which have received no kingdom as yet, and they will not until what? But receive power as kings one hour, there's your hour, along with the beast. In other words, when the wound, deadly wound is healed, and he, uh, cry, uh, the Antichrist is walking the earth, performing miracles in the very eyesight of man, as it is written, they're going to think it's Jesus come to fly them out of here. And they're going to, those that are biblically illiterate are going to jump on his bandwagon in droves, mass. 
because they've been taught wrongly. There is nowhere in this hour that it says you're going to fly. That hour is a very important time. It's the hour that Christians were, um, let, me, let me start uh, that sentence again. It is the hour that gives the duties of a true Christian at the very close of this earth uh, dispensation, what they're supposed to be doing. He's counting on you that you don't premeditate before because the Holy Spirit will speak that all children can hear the real truth. And uh, for one that knows that is coming to pass, that is to say that the false Messiah appears first, it is unforgivable for that one to deny that Holy Spirit. I can't help it. You're not going to have it. But I've got to go to another place where that hour is mentioned. And it was written to the Church of Philadelphia, which was one of the only perfect churches out of the seven that God addresses in the great book of Revelations, that is to say the unveiling. A church that had the key of David, that is to say to know the true Messiah because it would be through David's genealogy that he would come, not Cain's. All right. He that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. That means that knows the truth and cannot be deceived. Verse 8, uh, I know thy works, and behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Not denied it by, by hooking up with some false Christ, or by traditions of men. Listen carefully. Behold, verse 9 of Revelation 3, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, that's the synagogue we were speaking of in that hour, which say they are of uh, Judah, and are not, but it do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Why? Because you're at the feet of Christ. They're not worshiping you, but the true Messiah. Every knee on that day shall bow to the true Christ. Verse 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, that's this word, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. There's that hour again. Hour of temptation, why? Because uh, uh, it might be tempting for some to worship the spurious Messiah rather than stand against him. I, for one, do not think it will happen. You will be kept, why will you be kept from the hour of temptation? We do not find him tempting. We rather find him an abomination. And true Christians should stand up and look forward to the day that they can stand against him, allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through him, to, through them, to burn, if you would, this fake imposter. I will keep you from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world. Not just part of it. All of it, when they're getting ready to fly away, to try them that dwell on the earth, okay? It's a trial. All those that have been taught they're going to fly away, I'm sorry, you're in deep trouble. If that's all you know about God's Word, if you do not understand the duties that God expects of you as a true Christian, well, what is a Christian? A Christ man, one that does exactly what this word states. Otherwise, it's the unpardonable sin. Now, don't think I have just stated that all that think they're going to fly are going to commit the unpardonable sin. Uh-uh, that's not what I said. Those that know what that hour is, that know better, and will not allow the Holy Spirit to speak through them against Satan, that's unpardonable. Will it happen? I don't think so. I cannot conceive in my mind how anybody could be tempted when they absolutely know the fake when they see him. So there you have um, the unpardonable sin. There is so much more about that hour. It is Satan's reign on earth, and it's written in Revelation 9 as a five-month period, the time of the locust. And the great book of Joel as they were speaking on Pentecost Day, it goes into much more detail about that hour 
in Acts chapter 2 where that cloven tongue came upon them on Pentecost Day when the Comforter or the Holy Spirit first appeared and gave an example of what it will be like in this hour and how misunderstood it is by people. For if you read Acts chapter 2 verse 7, you find out that it wasn't an unknown tongue. Quite the contrary. The evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit is for every ear to hear it in the dialect of the very county in which they were born. For it's not the man speaking, but the Holy Spirit. That's the evidence of the Spirit being present. It's not Babel. It's clearly Acts chapter 2, verse 6 or 7. Do you believe God or do you listen to man? Now, I don't know. That's up to you. doesn't make me any difference. You can still be my friend, but I would highly recommend that you listen to the God's Word. But Peter would say when they said, that, that bunch is drunk. They, they look all like Galileans and are to be speaking like Galileans do, but they're talking my language. They must be drunk. And Peter said, no, this is that that Joel the prophet spoke of. And in the last hour, that hour, that the sons and the daughters both would speak, would prophesy. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is speaking through them. That's what the Holy Spirit did on Pentecost Day, and it's going to happen again when His servants are delivered up in that hour. And again, I would state very clearly, to refuse that and to give in to the temptation is the unpardonable sin. I do not believe that it will happen. I will be very disappointed if it should. I guarantee you anyone that tries to bow to Antichrist uh, that knows better while I'm around will get a size 13 boot right where it's needed. I don't think it'll happen because God's election detest Satan and would never, under any set of circumstances, follow him. We long to see him in the abyss, and certainly that's where he will go. So there you have it. How simple to understand the unpardonable sin. Let's go down, let's recap just briefly. Only God's elect can commit it. Why? Well, they would have to know that the Holy Spirit wished to speak through them before they could deny the Holy Spirit the opportunity to do it. So that, that uh, is nailed down. It can only happen to them, and it happens in one specific hour. That's when the elect are delivered up before the spurious Messiah and allow the Holy Spirit to brand him as what he is. We'll have more on this in the 21st chapter. Look forward to it. I'll look forward to teaching it. Now, returning to Luke 12, verse 13, and it reads, And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. In other words, he's, he's got a bunch there. Have him divide that up with me. Verse 14. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you. Now, this loses just a little bit in the, in the translation. What it says, I didn't come here to teach law. In other words, he came to fulfill law, not to teach it. And that would be a judge's place is to, to dis describe the law concerning inheritance. 15, listen carefully. And he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. In other words, really, life has very little to do with the real riches. I, I want to say that, that is to say the riches here in this earth age. Now, I want to make it very clear that following the Word of God, you will be prosperous and you will be successful, and there is no sin in being rich. 
But if you build your foundation on the riches of the world rather than the riches of God to begin with, you're, you will not possess God's blessings of riches. Money, yes. Houses, yes. Cars, yes. God adds on to you the things that you need. But if you are rich with mammon, which is to say ill-gotten gains, that's a curse and you'll not keep it. It will destroy you. So the only true riches come from knowing the Father, having peace of mind, and understanding that your real inheritance comes from your heavenly Father, not your earthly Father. Okay? Now I'm not saying that that an inheritance is not a, from your earthly father is not a wonderful thing. Uh, it is. That's what he wishes you to have and so forth. But Christ is making a point. Verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. 17. And he thought within himself, saying, oh, What should I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. I, I, I don't, I, I, how can I do? I'm weary here about this. I need more barn space, 418. And he said, this will I do. Figured it out. They, I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. Now, I want to ask you something. And Christ would want you to note this. Did he ask God for advice? No. He said he thought within himself. And when man thinks within himself rather than taking God's advice, he's headed for trouble. And if you would be very wise in making a, a very critical note concerning that very matter that his thoughts were within himself. He wasn't reaching out for guidance. Verse 19, and I will, I will say to my soul, soul, you see Christ brings in eternal here. Dost, uh, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Now he wasn't the least bit concerned about uh, that that was around him as God expects us to, to uh, uh, how many people helped him place these things in that barn? See, he didn't say a word about them. Didn't take care of them at all. Boy, I mean, he's all wrapped up in self, little bitty me. Verse 20, but God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? Where's it going to be? Well, it's going to be whoever is there, all right? Verse 21, so is he that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. Boy, I'm going to tell you what. Life in this earth and this flesh is very temporal. 70 or 80 years or even 100 may seem like a long time to some people, but out of the eternity, it's not much time, and it's over. And when it's over, it is over. And if you don't have anything to go on to past that, what are you worth? Not a zippo nothing. So if you do not take the patience to find a relationship between you and Almighty God who, who has control of the soul, for Christ had said, beware he that can give, kill the flesh but also the soul. Right? God controls the soul. So that's your very self. So you want to be careful how little old self thinks within itself instead of considering the Father who created that soul, or he can claim it just like that. It's over. So a life that does not broaden its parameters, a soul that does not broaden the parameters whereby it includes Almighty God and God's plan in his life, then 
uh, I'm sorry, the Father's not going to bless and he's going to strip him uh, bare than a tree uh, after a hurricane passes through. So uh, that's the way it goes. We're, th I don't want you to lose this thought, and perhaps this is a bad place to stop, but we must at this time. And it's leading up to worry warts, basically, and why people worry when you don't have to, because our Father provides for those that utilize His Word and practice it, and that their works are sufficient that God is pleased to add blessings onto you. Do you know something? Of all the teachings that are done about faith is the only important thing, do you know the only thing that you can take with you to Judgment Day other than soul is your works. Revelation 13, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 14, I believe it's verse 13 declares that your works are all that you can take with you. Why? It declares your rewards. What kind of life you're going to have during the millennium. Whether you still have riches in God or you got nada like this guy did. Okay? So anyway, we'll leave that thought. God loves you and he wants you to have everything that you need. He will even help you with it. As long as you do like he says and are not a worry wart, don't miss the next lecture if you happen to have a problem that's akin to that. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? Free introductory package. Say this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study.